What's good, everybody? My name is Alchemy. Welcome to the zero to hero process workflow of myself, which how I utilize this in which to either A, make sounds or to produce with. This is also going to kind of tie into a review-esque things about how this works, because I'll talk about some short bringings and upcoming things. But I want to give you some insight about what to expect for somebody that is a hybrid user. So I'm not Dawless. I also use um, Bitwig and actually I primarily use Bitwig and utilize hardware to enhance and add to it. But I want to talk about some different workflows in which you can utilize the Octatrack for. And uh, I'll give you some final thoughts towards the end of the video. So if that sounds interesting, then let's get on into it. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about is if you look at the routing here, I've got the analog heat uh, being sent in as getting audio from the DAW into a box. Then this box of the analog heat is actually coming into the uh, into the Octatrack. And the Octatrack is being sent into the Syntax and the Syntax is being sent back into the DAW. So basically what I can do is something like this to where I've already got some audio loaded in, but I'm going to delete this here. If I hit play on this, then I've got some mangled drums. And all I have to do is just let this play because I've got rolling sampler going on right here. So it'll kind of flop in between. And now if we kind of flop back over to this, you'll see here that on the rolling sampler, if I hit stop, all that sound that I recorded is coming back into the DAW. So if I'm trying to mangle audio or whatever, this is a great way to do it. If we play this back, you'll notice that it's a little bit more quiet. That's because of the gain staging of the analog heat, but check this out. So long story short, if I'm trying to create glitches and stuff, then I can utilize the Octatrack in which to do that. But that's not really what I want to talk about today. I just want you to be aware of that's one way to do this. Uh, which would fall into the second category, which was the effect processor that this can do. Um, it is a pain in the butt to set up if you're trying to get a hybrid workflow, but I do have a video on it and that will take care of that. But really, I want to talk about the overall approach to using this as a standalone device um, or getting sounds into here in a workflow that makes sense. So let's go ahead and hop over. There's going to be a lot of hypothetical stuff into this. Um, but try to bear with me because I really want to try to give you that zero to hero, you know, explain this to you like you're five on how to get the Octatrack up and running to understand how to use it to make music with on its own. So first and foremost, let's hit project. Let's go change. I'm going to hit yes. And then we're going to create an empty project and we're just going to title it something different. Yes. Okay. So if you want to make music on this, I want you to try to uh memorize this this procedure or this process it's record or load sounds then you want to slice those sounds or chop them or kind of um, edit those samples then once you have all the audio prepared you're going to utilize the record button here to put down these triggers and to put down a sequencer on this and once you have a sequence then what you can do is build custom effects by utilizing these effect snapshots one through 16. You also have four parts, so you can build more, but we'll talk about that later. And then you can morph between these to play with the effects. So that is the workflow about how to get something up and going. Now where things get complicated, it's like, all right, well, how do I do that? And that's what I'm going to walk you through very basic. I'm not going to walk you through an actual track. I'm just going to kind of hypothetically show you the process of getting some sounds, putting sound down in a sequence, and then destroying the sound, which should be just as fun and satisfying, but that's pretty much how this works. Some people say that this is more complicated than the MPC. I tend to disagree. I think that uh, it's a lot more simple, actually. It's just that uh, the MPC kind of has a little bit lower barrier of entry because of the way that it loads samples and stuff. But the actual sequencing in between the two, I find to be much more intuitive with this. So in any case, let's go ahead and check out hitting the record button. Oh, wait, if you do that, nothing works. What we actually want to do is get really used to this button right here because this is going to unlock a lot of doors for us. We're going to hit function and record. Now, what this will do is unlock the other settings of how to get these menus. And the number one thing that I want you to try to find whenever you have something set up is go to memory config and then go to these formats here to where everything is 24 bit. And then we're just going to turn up the recording time on here if we want to. So what this does is it means that the length goes further. And then that means that we're going to be recording in the highest quality, which unfortunately is only 24-bit. And that's my biggest complaint outside of overbridge lacking 
is that you can't put 48 kilohertz 32 floating point samples in here and that sucks because that's what I work at in the DAW and so you either A lower the quality of how you work in the DAW B uh, re-export all of your samples at that lower quality which is good if you like downscale rather than trying to make things upscale or C you utilize with what I was just talking about in the first place with getting sounds in here and then re-exporting even though it's going to be at that 24-bit quality which kind of stinks so anyways once we have that set up we're going to go to that function and record and we can have some settings here to where we're looking at it's fine it's fine but one of the major things um, from this is that if you hit record and hit play it doesn't do anything and so what you have to do is make sure that whatever track you're recording right now we're on track one you can select a different track by doing this we need to hit record and then set up a track trigger if it's red that means that it's going to play whatever audio is attached to this if any if it's green by hitting function and the step that's going to turn green that means that we're ready to record one more time long story short if it's red it's going to try to play whatever's on here if it's green then we're ready to record it's kind of confusing but um, just kind of utilize those color codes and you should be fine we'll say lime green because those are green too but lime green if you see this flashing red uh, green and red that means that you're in the midst of a sequence and it's going to wait until it cycles back so if you don't want it to flash like check this out hold on one second i'm going to hit stop and then now i'm going to do that now it's flashing just hit stop twice and then you'll see that we're going to record at the beginning of the sequence so um what we can do is we can record some drums in here if we want to so i did some stuff on superior drummer for the master classes earlier and what I'm going to do on this guy is just record that in with this drum loop just so you can see what it is that I'm doing. And now whenever I hit play, it's not synced up. You have to do this on your own, but I'm going to hit play on this guy and then I'm going to hit record. So ready? Three, two, one, record on this, then hit play on the DAW. Done. Now we hit stop. If I go to slice grid, uh, what's going to happen is going to say empty slot. Thanks, EasyBot. Uh, so what we have to do is hit shift and record three and go to edit this recording and go yes. All right. This is probably the most tedious part of this because, sorry about that sound stuff, because what ends up happening is you have to go in and start cutting this up. So if you're not accustomed to chopping loops, then you probably want to get accustomed to that. It looks like that didn't record because I did not have the analog heat on the proper track. So we're going to do that one more time. Yay. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go file and then go clear slot. Yes. Let's do that again. And I'm going to go uh, turn all this stuff off. And we're going to go track one. We're going to go record function and go shift record. Now it's green again. Let's do that one more time. Ready? Three, two, one. You notice that it's a little bit grittier because I've got the analog heat on it. Also a little bit more quiet, but that's okay because we can talk about that another time. Let's get out of recording mode. Let's go edit this recording uh, by hitting function and record three. Hit yes. And then go to either slice or trim. And there we go. So from this point, I'm going to only do like one or two slices just because this will take forever. And that's unfortunately kind of a slow workflow. But if you have something that's quantized to your tempo, which I did not change the tempo, this is at 120, where this is recorded at 85, uh, then you can do that. But what's cool is that this has time stretching and stuff. We're not going to be talking about that just because uh, I'm going to try not to be, not wasting your time, but really just focusing on, like, again, how this works. So I'm going to zoom this long ways. And I'm going to move the cursor over this way. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit yes. Uh, sorry, we want to go over to slice mode and do the same thing. The slice mode's right here. And from this position, I'm going to move this out a little bit further and get right up in there and go yes. And then we're going to go to add slice here and go yes. Now with the C knob, we're going to move this over until we hit this position here. And I'm going to leave one tiny little space right there. And then what I'm going to do is move the level now. So after I'm done moving the endpoint, I'm going to move to the C. And now you can see that we're right there. We're going to hit yes, go add slice here, and then pretty much do the same exact thing. So now we're going to go uh, one left over, move that over. Yes, add slice. <clears throat> Just leave one frame. Yes, 
add slice. And you really got to learn to love this process because otherwise it'll drive you crazy. And chopping audio is part of the biggest thing from, uh, I guess, any kind of hip hop or whatever it is that you like to do. But now that we have that, we're gonna go um, yes again. And uh, we can normalize the slices, do different kinds of processing to this, but we're gonna hit no. And now that we have this, we have a few different slices, which is great. Now, the problem with this is that once we go into this, the menu that you're going to have is this. And if you hit one through eight, it's not gonna do anything. It won't play the sample. If you hit nine through 12, it's going to play the initial part that you have set up per track. So nine is track one. Uh, we haven't assigned it yet. I'll show you how to do that in a second. And then 10 is track two, 11 is track three and so forth. But once we have the slices that we were wanting to utilize, we gotta go back to edit this recording. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go file and we are going to save and assign the sample. Hit yes. Just change this name into something different and go yes. And then we're going to assign to self. <clears throat> now that we have that, we're going to hit track one and this still isn't going to do anything. So we're going to double tap track one again. I think there's a more efficient way to do this, but I'm going to hit yes and go to the bottom and then hit yes. And now if I hit function and yes, then we've got that going on here. And to demo stuff, again, function and yes. So if you're trying to hit the thing and it's not doing anything, that's why. So now we can go into track one. And again, you'll see that it'll play. It might even loop, but we can't get it to those slices that we have set up. So what we need to do is we need to go function. We need to go down here and go into slices here. And what that's gonna do is pull this up. Now the problem is that you still see that if I hit this, it's still not doing the thing. And so what we need to do in order to make this work is we actually need to go into source and we need to turn this into slice mode here. And now you'll see that we've got a bunch of different slices here. I might have loaded the wrong loop, but it still applies. But within this, now what we can do is we can utilize these slices in which to lay down a track. And so hypothetically, I'd have to go back and make sure that the slices are where they want to be. But I'm going to hit record and uh, I can place stuff on here where I'd want that to be. So one, five, nine, 13. But the problem is that if I play this, it's all going to be the same slice. Yeah. So what we need to do is we need to hold a trigger down. Sorry, this one. And now what we can do is we can change one of these knobs in which to find what slice we want. So I'm gonna find the snare. I don't know, somewhere in here. But if you take a listen. So basically from this, we can find whatever slices those are by sliding in between the slices and changing and finding different stuff, which is how all this stuff works. Now, because of this, we have something called parameter locking, which is super sick. And what that basically means is as long as we're holding one of these down, we can make any changes via these parameters here and it will just lock to that step. So if you have nothing equipped, We'll say that, I guess, I don't know, that seems to work. And you start to change this around, it's gonna do it to the entire project. But if you have only one step on here and you make a change, then it's going to lock into that, which is really cool. Now, this is pretty much how you utilize this with everything, whether it be drum loops, whether it be with bass, whether it be through um, you know, percussion or pads or anything of the sort. And that's kind of how you walk through things. Now, something else that's really important for me is that if you hold a note and you utilize the arrows here, then you can utilize the trig counts and the conditions, which we'll talk about later, but you can offset these in which to create your swing or your sloppy grooves, which is really important to me. And I love utilizing this. If you need to make your pattern longer, you hit function and go page and hit this to 32 all the way to 64. And that way this will make copies per page 
on here. So you can duplicate this and then be like, all right, we're going to change that one out and then maybe have this on that 16th step. On this one, we're not going to have the kick, but we're going to have something right there and change that, make that there. On track four, we're going to make this much more simple and just utilize, you know, a snare on the five, nine, and 13. And so now whenever you see me flip between these pages, you'll see that it's a very fast way to create different iterations of the pattern that you initially created. And then you go back and do that with all of your tracks. Um, as a quick workflow tip, I try to have my kicks and snares on one track, then my percussion on a second track, and then my bass on a third, and then everything else in between on whatever subsequent tracks. Generally speaking, most people utilize uh, track eight as a master track. So if you go into your project here, I believe that you can go into the system. Sorry, we'll go into the project here and then we will go into, where is that? Change, sync to card, save to new, set, change. Nope, I didn't want to do that. Oops. Um, you can go into, I don't remember where it is exactly, but um, personalize OS upgrade. Audio. Yeah, so track eight will go into your master. Sorry, that took me, I had a brain fart there, but you can set that as a master and go yes. And then utilize that so that way this will be a master track but you know you don't have to it's just something that you can do so if you want to put a compressor or you know distortion or a filter over the whole thing then you can utilize that but that would be the only reason why you would want to do something like that because uh, that way it's it'll control effects over all the tracks you don't have to do that but it is something that you can do uh, so that brings us to the final step of this which is utilizing and building effects and so if i were to hit a you'll see that this is highlighted red and green Red is uh, what this either A or B is selected to. So if I hit three, you'll see that red is on three. And then if I hit B, you'll see that three is green. So that means that that's where A is at. Now behind these snapshots, you can have more than 16 based off of the parts that you can build. But behind these, the idea is that you have these different modes or these different snapshots of settings on here that change how this plays back. And then you have a crossfader here that you can morph in between. So as a typical thing, we want to only use track A as a standard where everything is off. And then we can utilize track B uh, to kind of hot swap or to slowly fade. You can have it jump or fade. Um, I haven't figured out how to make it jump from like zero to nothing, uh, but there is a way to do that. But for me, um, yeah, let's go into, this is on number two now. So now on number two, what I'm going to do is hold this <clears throat> and as long as I'm holding this and I change this up, then that means that this is going to go into something different. So I'm going to change the pitch to be down. And then what I'll do is I'll apply an effect. Uh, we already have a filter on this. So I'm going to apply that filter to where this is going to be playing at a lower pitch. And we can also filter that down maybe with uh, some resonance or something. Actually, I think that this is a, um, is this a filter? You can go into effects one here and double click on that. Okay, yeah, that's a filter. And then effects two is a delay. So while I'm holding this, we can change this into a tape delay maybe. And coming into that, you'll see that we can change the time into something different and change the base into some kind of filter or whatever. And so now what's gonna happen is whenever I move this over from one to two or A to B, it's going to give us some kind of morphing of the different effects. Now it might make more sense if on this, if I actually had some triggers on here, because I don't think that I've got anything now. I guess that kind of, oh, I think I, what happened was I loaded a new set. So let's go in here quickly and uh, change that. Let's pretend like I did all the slicing and whatnot and go yes. And then we'll just pull that up in here and go yes. Um, and then this will, should trigger now, so. Now that we have this, what's really cool is that we can go and start utilizing these steps. And like, you know, if you want to do it without slicing, you could do that too. We can set this to a different start point, uh, different length, different starting point, different starting point, different starting point. I have no idea what this is going to bounce into, but check this out. So 
So let's say for whatever reason, I wanted to change two into something different now. Well, what I can do is now I can be like, all right, I want this to uh, pitch up. So we're gonna pitch that up and then we're going to go into effect one. We're not gonna mess with that. Let's go into effect two and let's change the time and the feedback of this. And so now between this feedback, what this is gonna do is create a pitch up effect and also have a large amount of feedback. Actually, that's way too much. Otherwise, it's gonna blow us out of the water. But in order for this to work, we need to select that because now uh, between A, we've got one selected and then we can toggle B between two or three. Or we can also go from A and toggle two if we wanna constantly have an effect and put this in the middle so that way it will morph in between. So check this out. Then I can fast swap to regular playback, fast swap to two. and basically do a live performance of that while having lots of fun. So hopefully that gives you some kind of explanation about how to actually get sounds coming through this and how to make stuff work. I'm sorry I stumbled upon a couple of things, but um, yeah. Um, and again, if I wanted to uh, put effects over the entire project, then I can do that with track eight. And this, the parameters set up here, will all be applied to whatever tracks you change. So it's not just one track that you have to do this to, it's the effects on this track, the effects on this track, the effects on this one, this one, this one, this one, so forth. So <clears throat> you can end up creating like a really insane uh, performance kit. The last thing that I'll touch on, which um, is probably a burning question that you might have already researched but may not know of, is that you can actually set tracks four to one and then eight to five if this is not a master track to through tracks. And what that does is you can either A, set it to outcoming signals, or B, you can set it to playback or add effects to whatever it is that track one is on. So if I were to set track four, actually let's go track two, uh, double tap source into a through track, then what this does is it gives me two more effects that I can add on to, um, what's it called? Two more effects that I can add on to the uh, first track. So what that means is if I go through and then I go effect one, maybe set this into some kind of reverb or something. Uh, flanger, spatializer, comb filter, compressor. Oh, reverb I think is only on track two, or effect two, but we can do lo-fi on this. And then on this one we can go, yeah, I don't know why that is, that kind of stinks, but whatever. We can go spring reverb on that one. And then we'll go this way, turn the time up. And then now on this guy, I'm gonna set track three to turn the time all the way up and turn the mix up. <clears throat> then on effect one, we'll, we'll do the same thing. Maybe we'll, we'll turn the distortion up and we can sample rate this down or whatever and make it kind of nice and weird. So now uh, this is gonna to apply to this one as well. So check this out. not have set that up correctly because within this through track here if we go into the through and go yes sorry we wanted this to be a neighbor track I'm sorry uh, that is going to send the last track into here my bad neighbor track now this should work <laughs> Through track, the through track sends whatever the incoming signal is into an oncoming signal through, so that way it just passes the audio through. Uh, but the neighboring track says, oh, we're gonna listen to this track, and so you can kind of apply the first step up. Five cannot go to four, unfortunately, so it has to be four to one or eight to five. I don't know why that is, that kind of blows, but maybe it'll be fixed in an update. Who are we kidding? Probably not. Uh, so anyways, that's how I use the Octatrack, and that's how I have a lot of fun with this, and hopefully when it comes into mangling audio and stuff, you have a deeper sense of how the heck this thing works. So my overall review of it is it's outdated. <laughs> um, it's super outdated, but it is a lot of fun, and it is something that there's nothing else like this on the market, unfortunately, and um, it's just, it, it, it takes a special kind of understanding 
to appreciate it. And I'm really curious to like see people's paths of like this being someone's first choice of music, because I think that if this were my first choice of music production, I don't think that I would have vibed with it. Um, it's not until a decade later of experience that I have to see this for what it is and to be like, yeah, this thing is really freaking cool. Um, that being said, it does have an immense amount of limitations because it doesn't have overbridge. The sample rates and all that is really old. It takes a flash card, which I get why it takes a, um, a compact flash because the read and write speed are a lot faster, but even still that's really old technology. Um, and then aside from that, sometimes just the menu diving can, as you saw, I stumbled a little bit, can be a little bit confusing. But once you kind of get your hand, you get your head wrapped around it, like I only covered the surface of how to go from nothing to something very quickly, then you'll start to see a lot of beauty in it. And I think that uh, the limitations that it provides are enough for me that I'm like, yeah, I definitely could make beats on this or I could toss some crazy chops in here and start to utilize that for making something cool, you know? Uh, and the fact that I found a cool hybrid workflow morphing between both this and the DAW is definitely like a highlight that I'm really happy with. And I haven't really seen a whole lot of other people do that on the internet. So I'm not saying I made it up. I'm just saying I found a way to make it work. It was expensive, but it does work. And um, I'm happy with it. And I'm going to continue to try to explore this and not treat it as a DAW, but instead treat it as something that makes me approach uh, music production in a way that can complement the workflow that I already have, or I can take this away and go into over to the couch and try to strip back the tools that I have and just focus on creating a stronger composition. But the electron sequencing workflow behind this and even say like the syntax uh, and all that stuff is just so fun and so awesome. And I love the syntax. I love the octa track and the analog key plus effects and the way that they work together. Um, I got sucked in, man. I got sucked into the electron stuff and I'm not getting anything else. I have no desire for anything else except for maybe a diggy tone. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I have enough tools to play with that will last me a lifetime. So anyways, let me know your thoughts on the octa track. Let me know if you've uh, utilized an NPC uh, versus the octa track and we can talk about pros and cons, keep it respectful. But um, yeah, if you like to geek out on electron stuff, this is my review uh, from somebody that has been picking it up and going along the way. I'm not going to say whether or not you should buy it. If you're interested in it, I do have a Zounds link in the description, but I'm not saying that you need to use it, uh, but it's there in case if you want to support the channel and get one of the Electron boxes. So other than that, go check out EasyBot. Go check out John Makes Beats. Be sure to like the video and subscribe. Thank you all so much, and um, I'll be doing more Octatrack stuff now that the main thing has been covered out of the way. I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.